I was told to wait for an end, a secret end to the sting. So that's it, it's over. Nothing. Good morning, hello. Um, it's an absolutely sharp thrill to have been asked to chair the Educate in Essex Masterclass um, at the Edinburgh Television Festival. And I mean that. I think that anybody that follows me on Twitter will know uh, my love for you two. <laughs> Don't be worried. Um, so it was. <laughs> it was lovely. To, it was lovely to meet you both this morning, um, and you too, of course. Uh, this, <laughs> um, this morning, um, we're going to be delving into the world of the hit BAFTA-winning Channel Four series, Educate in Essex. We're joined by David Clues, head of documentaries at Two Four Broadcast, Mark Raphael, commissioning editor of Channel Four. Um, Vic Goddard, head teacher of Passmore's Academy, and Stephen Drew, deputy head. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a high five for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, in this master, I'll tell you a little bit what we're going to do. In this masterclass, we're going to be getting an exclusive behind-the-scenes insight into the hit documentary series, a step-by-step -step guide to how it um, how to transfer how it came to from an idea into reality. And our panellists will be talking us through this incredible journey. So over the next hour, we're going to be covering where the idea came from, um, why Passmore's Academy was the right school for this, the legal and the compliance issues um, around filming in the school, and how David and the team um, rigged over 60 cameras and 22 mics in the school, and uh, what the lasting legacy of the series will be. What is the lasting legacy of the so series? Have to think end. about that. <laughs> Um, but first, Vic and Steve, um, it was GCSE results yesterday, what happened? We were good, so we bucked the trends, we, uh, we went, we got out last year where they were managed to show our highest ever results, which was 50%, which I know if you come from a grammar school isn't rubbish, I understand that, but for our kids it's brilliant, and we, were, we went from 50% to 66% this Amazing. year, so we bucked the national trend. Well done. Yeah, it's, it's, um, ultimately, this year's been obviously been a really odd year for us. And if, it, if the results had gone down, then we were potentially yeah. open to criticism because we've done other things. Um, but thankfully they didn't, because everybody else back at school worked really hard, obviously, while we weren't there. Um, so no, yeah, dead chuffed. Dead chuffed for the kids. Lots of happy, smiling squeals yesterday, isn't there? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic news. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning, where the idea came from. Um, going back to the beginning, um, so ju just tell me, how did the idea for the series come about? Very roughly. Um, well, I watched a series on the BBC about schools, and it was quite boring, and it was all about catchment areas, mm. and it was quite dull. And I thought, uh, my memories of school was like I laughed a lot, had a good time, and I thought it's a good space, but it was it's never been captured in the way that I remember it. And I was talking to David. David was looking for his next. Job. Why was David the right person to go to? Um, I don't know, was he? Uh, no. <laughs> um, no BAFTA I, say so, Mark, uh, I think. They do, they I do. Think yeah, BAFTA they, say they, they do. <laughs> uh, n I went to David because The Family uh, was a series that we made, and David did Family 2, which was the Gorrible family, and it was hilarious. And I remember watching the <clears> first <throat> Rough Cut, and it, was, it, it moved on a leap from fa Family 1 for me, and it was very funny. And the one thing I knew I wanted the series to be was funny. So, and I, we'd danced around. We flirted with each other. Quite a lot. <laughs> and you weren't, ke you weren't keen uh, on the school idea, were you? Why were you not keen about schools? I mean, surely. Because I thought school was a bit boring. So really? I, I was sort of worried that there wouldn't be enough sort of drama there, I guess. So was we're still here, you know. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how, long, so how long did the flirting go on for? I think I gave you quite a hefty chunk of development money. Yeah, yeah. So and I said, go and find some schools. And if you don't want to make it, that's fine by me. Thinking, hoping that he would fall in love with it. And I remember you came back one day and you came to see me. You know, it's really funny. Um, I don't know if it was at Passmore's. You said some kid was uh, texting his mate in the, in the class. And the teacher caught him and he said, I'll just check in my ball, sir, for, for cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like our kids at all. No. They, they'd have just said, I'm on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> Busy. Um, so how long did it take you to find the right school? Um, probably about three or four months. I mean, we approached, I don't know, over a hundred schools. We were sort of we looked for schools that had either good or outstanding offsteads. So we thought they'd have a sort of confidence about what they were doing. And we were keen. We were keen to find a school that, that was, you know, wasn't troubled, as it were, yeah. and yeah, go for an yeah. everyday school. Yeah. And it would probably help us 
if it was good or outstanding. That was what I was thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So who made the call and who took it? Me, yeah. It was, okay. I was in my office just, and, there was, and David, was, David phoned up and said, I want to come and talk to you about something on TV, and it, it, it went from there, really. Did you, did, my, I mean, my, what, but why? I mean, surely that was a massive risk. Was, what, why I didn't, did you decide to suddenly seize the moment? I didn't know it? it was as much of a risk as it evidently is, because I'm sitting here in front of all these people. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and the Daily Mail would let me know that it was a big risk. Um, <laughs> I, we'd, well, unfortunately, one of our young men, a young man called Jamie Bone, died on December the 8th of three months before that phone call. Mm. And that very morning, I'd done an assembly with, I think it was year 11, it might have been year 10, which is the year group they ended up following. And it was all about not just saying no, taking opportunities, you know, every, with every opportunity there is a risk, so you know, make sure you weigh that up. And that was sort of a little bit of a, a mantra through the school at that mm. time, because actually, you know, Jamie was... He was born with a congenital heart defect, but was happy and added to the school and walked to the 800 metres at Sports Day that year because nobody from his house would do it. It was just a real... Somebody that you met and just made you happy just from meeting him. Um, and so I couldn't... It would be very disingenuous for me that morning to say, you know, l at least talk to the... You know, think of the risk, weigh up the opportunity, because ultimately my gut instinct when David phoned up was, don't be daft. Um, but... You know, it, we, I couldn't do that and live the life I was trying to live at school without at least talking to them. I didn't expect the conversation to end up where it's ended up. I expected it to end up going, to, yeah, all right, lovely. Good luck finding a school that's going to do that. But yeah, that, so then, how happen. did you? Did, then did you two have to flirt with each other? How did you? Do I, I, I deliberately sort of took a step back because at that moment, by after I'd met them, when they eventually turned up after you know, standing me up at the station and yeah, things. It wasn't uh, a good start. <laughs> oh, tell I, me about that. I went to pick them up from the station because that's the sort of thing I do and they decided to get a cab from the station. We'd forgotten. Yeah. So um, we arrived at the school, Vic's waiting for us at the station and it sort of it could only get better. It could only get better from there. Um, but once I'd seen David, ultimately what, what I needed to make a judgment was is do I trust him or don't I trust him? And when you make that decision that either, yes, I'm going to trust you not to damage my school, or I'm not, that's it. You know, I've either got to make that decision and believe in that or not. And I met him and he fooled me and I trusted him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I was going to say, how, I mean, people watching this, how do you do that? In a nutshell, how do you make people trust you? Well, because You've gone in and done that again and again in places. I think um, I'm genuine about what I want mm. to do. You know, Mark um, and I were on the same page. We wanted to celebrate school life, and uh, th there wasn't a hidden agenda. So we can just be upfront and honest. David looked me in the eye and promised that he wouldn't damage me, my school, my kids, you know, the reputation or anything else. And, it, and that, at that point, you have to make a decision. Is that person lying or telling the truth? Did you threaten him? He did I, say he's got some, yeah, I tough did, friends. I did threaten him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a guessing. South London Council Estate boy. You may or not guess that or not. Um, and I said to David, before he said about that I won't damage you or your school, I have to say, I said, I've got, I come from South London Council Estate. I've got some really horrible mates. You damage my school or anything to do with it, I will put you under a motorway. <laughs> And I looked him in the eye, and he looked me in the eye, and, yes. I, and I could see him going, he probably means that. <laughs> and I absolutely did. And then he said he'd never damaged me in my school or anything else. So at that point, we reached the pinnacle of, we have to make a decision. So then it went to governors, and governors, for me, it was important that it wasn't a decision that I took or any individual took, that it was a collective decision, because ultimately it was going to be a collective experience. Maybe more people need to... Threatened with actual violence. Yeah, that could be a way I'm not proud. Of, I'm not <laughs> proud of that fact. I have to say. But. Um, it was uh, eventually down to two schools, mm -hmm. and we have got a clip. We've got the taster tape of. Um, could somebody play that for me, please? Amazing. Um, would you say that your choice to go with these guys was that uh, their closeness with the children and the fact that they had that you know they had such a great rapport because. You know, you ended up staying in the school the whole time. You didn't go out, you didn't meet the parents, you yeah. didn't see them going out to whatever. I think, I think with that tape, you see how different uh, the material is when, you're, when someone's there filming it. The mm. kids are slightly more within themselves. And I think when we were deciding, I mean, it was ultimately David's call, but I think it sort of boiled down to Stephen and, and Vic being teachers that I recognised and I remembered. And I have to say, particularly Stephen, Stephen 
he's a teacher. In my head, if I was going to say, what's a teacher like? I'd go, like him. He's funny. But, you know, you've got that... And I think that helps viewers and us focus in on, on, on why we went with, with Passmore's over the Cambridge School. I don't know, what do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I think it was... It, it's definitely the relationship between Vic and Stephen um, and the sort of energy in the school. You go into <coughs> Passmore's and there's a great energy and that comes from the staff. And also, I think... It, what's interesting in hindsight is I didn't appreciate how much Vic is trusted within the staff and with the parents. So it made our job much easier. Um, actually, at the other school, the um, head was, was, was great and, 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 um, and, and you know, really wanted to do the, the series. But the, he didn't have the same relationship with the rest of the staff. So it would have always been much more of a battle. And I, I guess... Um, that well, sort of is an organic thing that you sort of pick up on when you go into a school that um, everyone gets on so well. I was going to move on to this because in pre-production, you know, gaining trust from everybody. I, this blows me away, what, how you did this. So, you know, you had to gain informed consent from all of the students and parents. And um, you wrote to every parent <coughs> and pupil in the school. And you had to visit 75 different homes before, before you set off yeah, doing yeah. this. You know, you, you, I mean, this, this is a big job. These rig shows are a really odd way to make television. It's like a, an iceberg. You only ever see the very top. I mean, Vic and Steve want to say that. The, the, the team's vast. Yeah. And the pre-production uh, is huge in terms of letters, consent. I think also there was, uh, you know, David and his team were in the school for about six weeks, <coughs> approximately. Yeah, not, the first. Not, not filming much, but filming bits just to get inside the school, work out how, you know, get, get a real genuine understanding of it. And that, and that pays dividends. that includes dividends. CRB checks. You've got consultants, expert consultants yeah. there. Yeah. Channel 4 lawyers, Ofcom, yeah. Yeah. the whole, everybody. The consent thing's really interesting because I, I was really clear that I didn't want to be part of that. Yeah. Because I hope the parents do trust me. You know, I've, I've worked at the school a long time. And most of the time, if I say we're going to do this or come, can we, they would say yes. And see, if, if I was writing the letter, or if I was making the phone call or doing the visit, my worry was always that they'd say yes to something they were uncomfortable to out of loyalty to me. Um, and it was really important that I didn't do that. As it happens, in the future, what happened was I got some hideous Freedom Information Act requests, um, some about exactly what we're talking about now, and I was able to say, I've got no records, I've got nothing of it, I didn't deal with it, I've got nothing on paper at all, everything I did was in person. Um, and that, not that he believed me, the hideous man that keeps writing to me, but that's, that's yeah. what, that was really, in hindsight, fantastic that they did it that way. Yeah. But it was, it was more important that actually this was a decision that a parent, an adult, made about a child and their ability to cope with whatever would come from that, rather than it being my decision and influence. And it was, it yeah. was it, in, in hindsight, was absolutely the right thing to I th do. I think it's very much like any documentary it's about the relationships that we, the filmmakers and the production team, have with all of the staff, all of the, the contributors, the, the, the students. I mean, uh, you know, we did at least 75 home visits. We had an amazing team on, on the mm. series who um, got to know the students and their parents. Mm. So the work that went into that meant that when we started filming, we, were, we weren't sort of strange faces. Mm -hmm. We were... Grace or, or Gemma or whoever the team was that they yeah. really got to know. And, and that, that was really important because, I mean, even yesterday, Gabby Burton, who's our head girl who was in the <coughs> series, she was cyber-bullied in the series. Mm. Um, she got her results yesterday. And the production team, Gemma and Grace, knew her results. What did she do? Uh, brilliantly. Did She's a she? superstar. Yeah, absolute superstar. Yeah, she yeah. was fantastic. Um, you know, they knew her results because she texted them, you know, and that relationship yeah. continues, which mm. is... Lovely, and I think Grace and Gemma are, were really key, specifically with the girls, because they're not necessarily, and I please take this the right way, the normal kind of young female within this industry, it seems. <laughs> they're quiet, they're, they're, they're very, very humble in what they do, mm. and, and got the kids' trust through that. Um, and yeah. that was really important, the, the, the team in the background, which was immense. I didn't have no clue you'd have 20 people running around the school. Um, <laughs> You know, that, that, how they handled things was, was very good. But how did you decide? I mean, you could have went through the whole school. What, what, you had every angle you could have done in the school. Why that year and why at that time? What, I wanted why? to do the eldest year because I think they could handle it more. I, we also shot it and, and didn't air it until the kids had left school. Or the, 
the, the lion's share of kids are in it. I, I didn't want them to be bullied or teased about appearing in the series. So it was a decision about could they handle it. But I mean, going through that process, some people, kids were up for it, some weren't. Stephen was a bit reticent, weren't you? I mean, early on... Hostile, you took I think, was the word. <laughs> it was hostile was the word you used yesterday. I mean, going back to your thing about trust to begin with, I think relevant to those who might be considering making something similar in the future. I didn't trust them at all when they first turned up, to be honest, because my perception, and again, come back to Vic's thing about apologise, is that you're all bastards, basically. <laughs> Um, my, my perception when David first appeared... We're at Leveson next week, just yeah? so that you know, just to tell him that. My, my, my perception when David and team first appeared was, why the bloody hell should I trust these people? Actually, you have no morals, you have no <laughs> sense of ethics, and all you want to do is make money. I was quite upset by that. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did fine. he say this to you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I was blunt as anything. Yeah. I, because I knew that they wanted to come in and they wanted to do the filming right into the heart of what we do. And we are so passionate about what we do. And actually, one of the things that Vic and I always say to our teachers, it's not about you as teachers. And actually, parents, it's not about you as parents. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I don't actually care if you as a parent are upset by something we've done that will make your child's life better. And I'm not actually that bothered if staff are upset by something we've done which will make the child's life better. It's all about the children. And I found it very hard to begin with to get the idea that a bunch of media types making a documentary could actually care about children as much as we do. So I was very, very blunt with David about it. And coming back to your thing, Grace, about how people build trust, they built my trust by the fact that every single question I asked them, however blunt I was to them, however assertive I was to them, aggressive I was to them, they had an answer, they came back, they went away, they came back, they thought about it, they obviously cared and thought what was going on. And having this team of people communicating with parents and kids, going out and visiting kids, having their psychologists on board, was the thing that eventually convinced me, you know what, these people are actually real. And the way in which they did it to make the program, they didn't cut corners. They didn't say, oh, well, actually, we've only got enough money to do this, this. They did every single thing we told them they needed to do. And for me, at the end of the day, you can only ask people to do so much. And actually, in the end, you have to trust people. And if they do what you ask them to do, and they follow through the ethos that you want, you have to trust people. So I did go away from originally thinking they're just going to screw us completely to actually trusting them and actually believing what they has, said. Has your opinion been changed now of media people? Would you like to apologise to them? <laughs> <laughs> Take, give me this opportunity, no. Steve. 10% yeah. of you, I think. <laughs> no, um, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Because, <laughs> absolutely not, beca keep absolutely going. not because, keep going, yeah. because, you're, because you're human beings and you have a job to do and actually ethics only go so far. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you have a job to do and you can't be expected to be paragons of virtue all the time. So I don't really hold it against people at all. Mo oh, you've relieved. Moving on. You're relieved. Um, <laughs> um, I was going to say, when I started watching it, I was really surprised how... Um, it, how much the kids put themselves out there, how, how exposed they were, how they didn't mind being filmed. But then when I started looking into this, there's this idea that I'd love you to talk about this whole Twitter, Facebook generation, which, you know, yeah. that they, they've never known anything different. No, they live their life they, and, uh, in the public, in a way. You know? Yeah. In, in their heads, our children, this generation of young people, probably some of the people here, feel they live in the public already. You know, yeah. so many friends are on Facebook. Do they know them? No. Are they their friends? No. But they want to be my mate. Great. You know, Twitter's exactly the same. How many followers you got? Mm. They, these children feel that they live their life in public already because they tell everybody, going on holiday, great, the burglars will love that. Your mum and dad will be delighted. <laughs> you know, they do that already. So the jump from this to being in the box in the middle of their TV, you know, in the middle of their room, wasn't that big a step. Actually... It was much more uncomfortable for me. Yeah, for the, for the, the older and generation. Probably less comfortable for Steve, as he loves it. But much, <laughs> much, uh, much more uncomfortable for us than it was for them, I think. They, they, didn't, they weren't phased. You know, we walked in, we, we did ITV breakfast, I whatever it's called, daybreak, the morning of the first show. And we said, we'll only do it as long as we're back in school at the right time for the start of the day. So we walked back in the school, kids were like, saw on TV this morning, sir. I like, how was it? All right. <laughs> That's it. What do you think you look like on telly? Beautiful. <laughs> I just think I look ridiculous all the time, so it doesn't make any difference to me at all. As my, as my wife, as, as my wife would say in every single episode that she watched. I thought you were a couple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time. I, if you ever watch any of the series back or any of any of these clips, you'll see next to my head in my office there's a passport sized photo of Stephen. Because when you do the staff photos, they come to me. So I cut one out and said, I've got to have Stephen by my side all the time. So I stuck it on my wall, not realising that three million people were going to see that. <laughs> and on the way here, we, we were in Stansted and there was a group of I don't know, probably 19, 20-year-old girls sitting opposite Steve as I'd been chopping. Um, and I came and sat down and they were like... 
<laughs> I'm like Stephen, I think they may have recognised at least you, if not you and me. Um, going on a holiday went, together. And they went, <laughs> <laughs> So I went, oh, Stephen, how's your wife? And uh, <laughs> how's all that going on? You know? um, um, and it's not that I'm in any way offended that they thought I was gay. I was thinking, what are you doing, Vic? It's fine, let's skit. Let's go and, you know. But. Can I... Although you're really making me laugh. Can I? On, I'm gonna, I was going to say, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about the sure. rigging process, and then we're going to go on to um, a clip of a storyline about Vinny that I absolutely, I absolutely love that storyline. But very quickly, can you just talk us quickly through the rigging process? So, how many cameras did you use in the school? 64 cameras, um, 80 ambient mics. So, mm -hmm. drop those around. Maybe there'd be like a couple in Stephen's office, some in Vic's, some in the sort of communal areas, um, and then we had 22 radio mics. So. There'd be around, uh, I don't know, half a dozen teachers every day on their radio mic, um, and then uh, probably 20 to 30 of the students, depending on what stories we were trying to follow. Logistically, it was a nightmare because we've got cameras in four classrooms, so we were having to sort of juggle the timetable so our year 11 groups could go through those classrooms. So the work that went into that with the other teachers because we were having to move other teachers who weren't being filmed and some of them didn't want to be involved in the series at all. So there was a lot of sort of work going on behind the scenes to, to make that all happen, um, I guess. We've talked a bit about how you got into the school and how disruptive you found that and what I found, or how, you, how disruptive you didn't find it in the end yeah. and how you all gelled together. And what I find amazing is that you never lost a story really, along no, the way, no. and you didn't, and, and I, I find it fascinating, I think, the, you know, I was just saying, as the lights went down, some of the access that you got to some of, some of the things, um, like bullying, and this story, can I have the clip of, um, it was quite a serious storyline about um, a pupil called Vinny, please. I hate living through this again, I have to say this, so if I blub, I'm really sorry, I'm a great big Jesse, I know, but I hate living through this one. Absolutely incredible footage. I think that she is fantastic, that mm. teacher. I think that she, she's so fierce, but She was in her second year of teaching. She's incredible. We, we promo I promoted her in her first year of teaching, and she's her empathy, yeah. but that tough love that you have to have when dealing with teenagers is just right. She's just got it so right. Mm. I, I put it down to Irish background. She's got that family, tough yeah. love aspect of, there are times when you've just got to chin up, Get on with it, it's love. the way she words yeah. things. Yeah. Whereas I, th I think I'd have probably went in swearing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so angry yeah. at what he was doing. It, her, um, rea her reaction to mum saying, "Yeah, I've kicked him out. He's not coming back again." And you just have to go. I can't. You can't sit in judgment as much as you want to sit in judgment. You can't. And she didn't, which is stunning. I think she, she's a, a fantastic professional. Um, so you have these incredible storylines. Um, I mean, how, how do you edit all of this together? You've got all of this different stuff going on. How do you choose? Right, I heard a rumour. <laughs> he started it. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a rumour that some of the episodes actually took about 18 weeks. It's all lies. It's all edit. lies. <laughs> well, they did. They took, yeah, it, they took they a long did. time. I think the, the, the thing about the, the rigs, I think you get that. I mean, I, that material, that access, that honesty, you, you can't get from... Uh, you know, people filming that normally. But this series is tricky because unlike One Born Every Minute, you mm -hmm. know roughly who you're filming with. Unlike 24 Hours in A&E, it's roughly, fra you know, it's a prism of time that you're working with. This is, we, we shot it, we were following, we knew what was happening, but how we put it together was a real headache. And I don't think it... We ended up filming. We had ideas before we, we, we went. We had themes. And also, we, they, we, didn't, they didn't necessarily materialise the way. We, I mean, it's real life. So it was like, what are we going to do with that? And I think that's where David's brilliance came in. And uh, he managed to carve out, you know, really emotional, funny, engaging stories out of something as, as Stephen and, and. The storytelling aspect is amazing. I mean, for me, the things that, you know, I didn't know, because there's no lights on these little footballs on the wall, you know, you. I had no clue that I was followed from my office down the corridor, along the stairs, upstairs, into Vinnie's, where Vinnie's. No concept until I sat and watched that episode for the first time. No concept whatsoever. And for me, the things that eventually ended up being a story are isolated incidents in our lives. You know, they don't happen one after the other. And between dealing with Vinnie at the start of the day, I've been called a wanker by a year 10. I've had a year nine mum in. I've had somebody, you know, 
although they, they are isolated incidents in a day, yeah. to make them a story is an unbelievable skill that David had, that obviously you know, people involved in this industry had. The, the, the power of telling a story is massive and therefore putting out those very isolated incidents into something that ran chronologically, made sense, and also took you with them. So this, um, was this kind of, yeah, this balance, this balance of humour, are you all right? Yeah, just about. <laughs> <laughs> um, the balance of humour and the warmth and the tone. Um, I That's think all there, though, because of the staff and their relationships with the students and with each other. So actually, and that goes back to the early days of, of when we started researching mm. and developing the idea and going into different schools mm. and feeling that atmosphere. Um, and I, I, it's the thing that I am most sort of pleased about is that we were able to sort of show that and show those relationships. I think we could have gone into some schools where they'd have been very nervous about that, mm. that they wouldn't, that teachers wouldn't want to sort of expose that side of themselves. Well, I was, was going to say, so um, I... I chose a, a sad moment, but I wanted to show you a funny moment. Um, and uh, you. it's just you. No. <laughs> um, and, and this is the Christmas at the school, and you're uh, doling out the secret Santas. <laughs> oh, that's not me. Oh, it's nice, all right. Okay. Well, we still do. They still let us do it. That's <laughs> the most amazing thing. So you've, you've let these people into your school. They filmed and filmed and filmed. When you first see an episode, or you see, you know, you, you, you see, a, what did you think? It's got to what be you, because that was all what, you, that one. What? Um, it, it comes back to my original thing about to do with trust, and actually, and then Vic's thing about the camera following you around. I think one thing you've got to bear in mind is we just had no idea at all what it would no. be. No. No idea at all. And what was quite interesting watching the first episode was that he kind of watched it and it was like, yeah, I remember that, I remember that, okay, I remember that, I remember that. But obviously, when it's edited and put together, it isn't in absolutely the order that things happen, because that's not obviously how you tell stories. Was there anything that smacked you in the, f in the face right away and you thought, oh, I, I, need, I need that to be taken out? I was, it wasn't about being, it was never about things being taken out. It was about things maybe being presented in ways that weren't entirely fair, mainly to the kids, mm. to be honest. And when I say not entirely fair, I don't mean as if somehow David had edited it in a way that was out to get them. Because as I said earlier, actually, we'd completely moved on from that and we had the complete faith that they were going to do the right thing. It would be more that there would be a bit where maybe, I don't know, maybe they showed 10 seconds or something. And in my mind, I'd be thinking, hold on a minute, in the following three or four seconds, actually, that kid apologised. Or in the following three or four seconds, that kid pulled a face or rolled their eyes or breathed in a certain way. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know it happened six months, but I can remember it like it was yesterday. And actually, a lot of the conversations we have were more about that. It was never about us saying to them, you, you can't share that, you cannot show that. It's always about context, isn't it? Yeah, we've made, sure made, 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 made the decision to trust them. And, and what about the parents and the, the, the pupils? Were they, did, did any of them? We had one, one um, it was the um, bullying episode with Carrie and Ashley, where Ashley hated it because actually, in her mind, it made her look weak. And that was the only one I had any any input, you know, I went, I went to her house and sat with a, f a family and her and we watched it again together prior to it going out in the summer. Um, and it's interesting there because obviously we were very careful of, of, about how we told that story yeah. and there were certain things that it, it just wasn't appropriate mm. to include, so we didn't. Mm. Um, and of course you think contribu contributors are going to react a certain way um, and that Ashley would have been concerned about certain information and it wasn't that at all. It was all of a sudden that she felt like she was a victim. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, think the th I think the thing again, I think the thing for me was obviously I had, we had no particular idea of what they would put in each episode. Not clear. And although they kind of mumbled here and there, well, it might be this, it might be that, whatever. And then suddenly watched the first episode and kind of watched the whole thing. And I sat there for whole. It starts with you singing. It starts with me I mean, singing. I just remember kind of sitting there going, "Well, right, okay." There's not. We, we didn't then? ask for anything to be going? removed about us. There no. were two things that we. We, we weren't comfortable with, I, I stick in my mind. But I was fully aware that we'd signed our life mm. away. We'd given editorial control yeah, over what was going to go in national television to an individual company. We'd done mm. that, and so we had to be certain that, that it was a dialogue, and that's what David and Andrew, who's here somewhere over there, um, did really, really well. Mm. Where the, we, went, you know, we sat in this darkened room in the, the best hotel in Harlow, Travel Lodge. Um, and, On the tiniest uh, TV. Yeah, the tiniest TV. <laughs> And, you know, it was like, I'm really uncomfortable with that. And, and Andrew, specifically Andrew, actually, was, well, this is the story. This is how actually I see it, 
when I first saw that, this is what it made me feel. Because how we see it from the inside with a child that we care passionately about and therefore have a certain view of will be very different to somebody who's never seen this child before, who doesn't know the herd, doesn't know the school, doesn't know us. And so that was that dialogue between us and the production company made all the difference in getting some things, you know, clear off scumbags, for instance, was one of those, which if, you know, if you're a reader of the Daily Mail, you don't understand irony, but if you're 14, you do. Um, you know, that I was going sort of to oh. move on just to, yeah, to the, the, the very strong reaction of the press. Um, um, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll read a quote out. Yeah, please. I, let me guess which one it's going to um, be. What sort of example is this to set our children? Teachers calling pupils scumbags and the head flicks V-signs at his deputy in school. I was with as his way. deputy in school praises, <laughs> his, his praises outstanding. Where's that from, Gas? The Daily Mail. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That went, that went the online. Did you just call pupils on the Headflix visa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sorry, That went online that scan, halfway yeah. through the first episode when they hadn't been given access to the episodes prior. Yeah. And the, the reaction of the public, <laughs> they closed down the comments mm. feed on that within two hours because they've had 500, 600 comments all saying, get a life, what are you talking mm. about? Mm. That... Yeah. That 24 hours mm. from that Daily Mail article going online was the most difficult and challenging in my professional life because it felt all of a sudden that it was about us. Mm. And my job is, is, is nothing about me. My job is about the children I serve. And all of a sudden, I'm there on, a, on the, the morning after with doing a... We had a CPD day, actually, so we had no children in. We was, I, was doing, I was talking to staff and I was crap. I remember standing in front of me going, blah, 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 blah. It's making no sense whatsoever to get called out of that by somebody saying, just to let you know, the Daily Mail are in, are in reception, they want to talk to you. I'm like, really? Lovely. So in I go, and at that point it was, sorry, we're not to talk to anybody unless it goes through Channel 4 Press Office, they agree who we talk yeah. to. Um, it would be good for your school. And at that point, my head exploded. I escorted the young lady out of the building to find a photographer hiding behind a car with a long lens camera, hoping to take photographs of our children doing things wrong. So I called him a paedophile um, and, <laughs> and said that you do understand that you're a middle-aged, overweight, greasy man kneeling behind a car with a long lens camera with a secondary school, a primary school, a nursery, all within eyeshot. And I'm going to call the police. I'm, I'm a journo, mate. I'm a journo. Get in your car and piss off. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. And then the Daily Mail had never made any more contact with me after that. And they and actually... Did they also write a column for them? Yeah, they... Yeah, they <laughs> took, yeah. A, a, apart from to ask me to write for them. <laughs> I know that's going to go on telly as well. I'm really sorry, Mum. I, 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 have... I, I think that 24-hour period was tough. We talked on the phone. And you felt... I was hideous. You were really in, a, in a, a quite a bad way. I was hideous. But I think... Uh, you know, the time passed, we kept talking. I think you felt that the public's perception of uh, the series was positive. Mm -hmm. 20,000 20, sudden, emails later. Your emails came in yeah. and you were like, yeah. you know. What I was going to say though, so you've got this reaction coming through in the Daily Mail, but you've also got this incredible avalanche of love mm, on yeah. Twitter. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I, 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 record I, okay. amounts of yeah. but love. Think, Mr Drew through. trended number three in the world. Mr, <laughs> Mr. Drew for Prime Minister was my favourite one. But you've got to remember is, is that, I mean, for instance, the Daily Mail thing for me is one of the things I'm most proud of. I have the Daily Mail article, the three pages of it, in a frame on the wall of my office at home. And it is the thing I'm most. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. And we of both the whole have a T-shirt which says, "Yes, I'm the one the Daily Mail warned right. you about." <laughs> so. And for me, for me, actually, after the initial shock of that negative reaction from the Mail and the Telegraph, we basically reprinted the Mail story. And actually, once you move slightly on, we kind of reflect on the conversation. In the end, I kind of thought, Do you know what? Actually, the fact that you hate it, and the fact that mm. you, with your narrow-minded, bigoted, prejudiced views of state education, hate it. Do you know what? I'm glad you hate it. I'm actually proud that you hate it because you have no idea what goes on in the reality of state schools in this country. You hate everything about state education. You hate young people. So do you know what? I'm proud. So I have that on the wall. And it's on the wall of my office. And but then... that's the difference between you being a deputy and me being a head. If that was your new school in September, you would feel differently about that because as much as yeah, you want to tell them, piss off, you're, you're a fascist... Ultimately, if it damages your school, you can't. And that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. They were damaging our school's reputation. And the last thing I needed in the six weeks leading up to parents choosing which secondary school to send their 11-year-olds to the following year was for us to be seen as anything other than who we are. 
And I think that, for me, the biggest thing was it was unfair. What they were saying was unfair. The comments they made on press photos of children, specifically there was a comment about Ryan, who's, who's the, Asper, the, man, the young man who has Asperger's, was just so morally bankrupt and so potentially damaging to the young people that it, 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 I, I felt like my soul had been ripped out. It was hideous, it was absolutely hideous. But then that's when the channel specifically and, and, and Jay Hunt and everybody else, they rallied, they rallied around us and they did, we were never left alone. Even today when I get a ridiculous information act request for about the show, I just send it to Channel 4, the legal team deal with it, they send me back the email. You know? So from that point of view, as much as yeah, you know, in the grand scheme of things, sitting back now, are the right wing and the left wing and the press gonna love us? No, of course they're not. Is the Daily Man gonna love us? No, of course they're not. There was a fantastic, beautiful article in The Guardian that came out a few days after, which my mum wouldn't have said as many nice things about me as the journo did. <laughs> um, you know, and, and at that point, you start to get a balance. But for those 24 hours, I thought it was going to be watched by our mums and a few of the parents in Harlow to be known that we're going to be on page four or five of the Daily Mail this big. That, that was completely out of anything I expected to happen. Can I talk just very briefly about ratings? So you've got this story, this programme that everybody seems to be talking about. It's wound the Daily Mail up, it's big on Twitter. How did you feel about the ratings? I felt good about the ratings. Um, what did you get? I think, I can't, I can't recall, I mean roughly, overnight was about 1.7, 1.8. 1 1.7, it, consolid it consolidated, it consolidated really well, it was incredibly young. And uh, our, I, they, we get these uh, demographics and you have the overnight big figure and then it breaks down into 16 to 34s and I never look at the, that too much. And uh, I should do for me. And uh, I remember Jay coming and goes, it's got a 20% share for 16 to 34. So I was like, oh, great. And, uh, but it was, it was a big thing, because it, because the young, young people watched it and really loved it, it grew. And so it was one of those series that grew incrementally. And then, and like people say, were watching it online. Online, it was it massive, was it was huge. huge. So it would jump up. So the consolidated figure each week was like 2.3, 2.4, it kept growing. And that was a surprise, because usually, you start quite big and you just gently drift away. But it was going up and up. And I, I, I love that you don't look so much at the ratings. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We looked. Well, I do. I we do. looked. Because yeah. it, it was such a bizarre thing. I was in 1.7 million people's bedrooms. How did you find out? Like, how, how ridiculous is that? How Jay, did you find Jay, out the ratings? Did you ring or did you go into just Jay, Jay actually emailed me. Jay right. emailed me and went, you do understand that you've been in more, you've, more people have seen you than you'll ever meet in your life <laughs> last night. And I'm like, oh shit, that's really scary. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's, yeah, that came from her. That I've, was odd. I've got a clip that I wanted to show, and um, it, it's just more examples of, um, of, uh, of your relationship with, with the pupils. And this was a really, this was a really, um, it was the relationship between you and Molly. My friend Molly. Yeah, oh. it's, it, yeah it's, it's, um, it's very good. Can I see that clip, please? There's nothing, there's nothing more annoying than when you're angry for somebody to be that calm. Yeah. There's oh. nothing more annoying. No, when you just, you, She was desperate for him to shout at her. So desperate because she knows the shouting. She understands shouting. She understands somebody shouting her down. And to sit there just like that. God, I would have killed um, you if I was her. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he taught me a, a technique upstairs about the word shame. Yeah. It, apparently, that's one of the best words that teenagers you can use. That like shame. The teenagers hate the word shame. Yeah. Shame. My mum tells me she's ashamed of me, and it kills me. And I'm 39, and she's 73, <laughs> and she tells me that now. And I hate it. shame. Is it, it? It's very interesting. I think education and stuff within society is very interesting in that I don't think it's that we've lost the ability to understand how actually as adults we can completely criticise children and do things. But actually, people do the wrong thing, mm. and some things that people do are just wrong. There's no grey areas about it. They're wrong. And actually, when children behave really badly for no good reason at all, just because they feel like they're wrong and they should be ashamed of themselves. And actually, if as human beings we don't understand that sometimes we need to be ashamed of what we do, we need to look ourselves in the mirror, look ourselves in the eye and go, do you know what, actually, that was wrong and I'm ashamed of what I've done there. How the hell do we improve? How the hell do we understand? How do we go forward as a society? How do human beings get better? And surely as a teacher, one of our jobs is actually to have enough moral courage, enough moral purpose to say to a young person, do you know what? That's actually really bad. Yeah. There's a you phrase I use that Steve wrong. hates. You need to look in the mirror, not out the window. And I use that with the children quite a lot, or I use that with teachers quite a lot. If a kid fails, the first thing I say is, look in the, mi look in the mirror, not out the window. 
where's the problem? Don't blame them, blame yourself. Did watching yourselves teach, has it changed what you do one single iota? No. It has with no. Stephen. He doesn't wipe his... And I doubt if Ben eats his uh, spilt yoghurt off his tie anymore either. But I, no, I, I have to say, I don't, think, I don't think any of it has changed one iota. Yeah. What's changed is that our, we're in a new building. Yeah. Apart from that, nothing else has. Um, I'm going to talk about the future and legacy. Uh, uh, you're, there's a second series in development, um, and you're going to a different school. Yes, yeah. you are. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it very briefly, about should we do another series. Uh, Vic uh, moved school to a different building. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, Vic, your feeling was you weren't keen. Uh, and I sort of agree, agreed with Vic. I, I don't know if we'd get the same... What we're after there is, you know, re that's, that feels real, doesn't it? Mm. And I think if we went back to past morals, there's a chance it might not feel quite as real. Mm. So Vic wasn't... Vic, so you felt that. Is that that's fair, yeah, it's it? fair. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. me, yeah. The living in the eye of that storm this year was, was draining. Um, so when we made a decision, not one person knew what the output was. Nobody knew it was going to look like that. We didn't know it was going to look like that. Children didn't know it was going to look like that. So we were very much natural. We were very much who we are. Because we've been through that already, and it's, we would be different, my biggest fear would be that I never write anything down. I never prepare an assembly, which some of my times my staff would say, well, they can see that. Um, but so I, I go and I talk to the children. I look them in the eye because they're my kids, and I talk to them like they're my kids. Um, my worry is if, if we were to do it so soon again, that I would have dancing girls and jugglers in every assembly. Mm. That I'd have PowerPoints coming out of my ears and it would be death by, by presentation because oh. I don't want to be that, and I don't want to be that person. That, that's my biggest fear for no, nothing to do with the, the impact of the show or the channel or, or David or anything like that. It's purely, I need a break. And you, um, you mentioned this briefly, but I don't know whether people picked up. Stephen, you're, you're going, you've been. Oh, I've managed, do you to make, find, managed to escape. Do you want to make the, <laughs> do you want to make the announcement? <laughs> that. Mr. Gove made the announcement Mr. in Gove. our school. He did. Um, obviously, I mean, I've been teaching 15 years, and in actual fact, I, from day one of being a teacher, I knew I wanted to be a head teacher. And I was going through the process of looking at application processes, whatever. Obviously, as David touched on there about how we moved to a new school, kind of quite a lot of people in our school who in quite sort of senior positions held on for maybe another year, two years, not because of the programme, but because we wanted a year in the super brand new building. So I finished my headship qualification. Obviously, we did the programme, did through that, and then did the year in the new building. And then from sort of, I suppose, sort of March onwards, was applying for head, for, to be head teacher, for head teacher at other schools. And then April had my interview, and then, well, what are we now? God, it's like a week and a bit start as head teacher of a school in Brentwood. Then you 15... close the door and there's nobody else but you, buddy. Absolutely. <laughs> so about... Shit travels downwards and it lands on you. <laughs> Will you miss him? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Will you miss him? Will I miss him? Of course. You know, I, we, the, the only negative the school got out of this, and it was absolutely obvious in hindsight, is that staff got jobs because they were on the telly. You know, we lost, my staff turnover has been less than 2% for the last five years in, a, in an industry, in a, in, a, in a profession where it's 15% minimum. Um, and that's been brilliant. But this year we've had a big turnover, well, it's still below national average turnover, but a turnover. Because if you put Passmore's Academy on an application form, they went, oh, I know that school. Well, let's, let's get them in anyway, because, you know, we'll have a chat. And people got jobs. So I was always ready for Steve to go. In fact, Steve was looking a little bit the previous year. And if he'd gone last summer, we would never have shared this experience, and that would have been a real shame because we've had so much fun doing so many stupid things this year. Can I? Um, can so I it's been brilliant. I, was say, I will I miss him. I'll miss him like a like an absolute next leg. But how did I? I've had to replace him with somebody I also trust. So my best man from my wedding is now my deputy. Bizarrely, oh. how <laughs> nepotism rules, eh? <laughs> um, I was going to suggest um, a legacy. Is that um, I heard that on a lot of teacher training, the teacher training agency has said that on loads of applications, mm. people are, are talking about you. I think... And that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty amazing. It's been, it's been a real... It's been, that's been the biggest treat for me mm. in the fact that we've gone to university. We've been asked to go and talk at universities for training teachers and to go and talk to the future of a profession that we are so passionate about and say, look, don't go out there. Don't look at your paycheck every month because actually every month I say the same thing. God, do they pay me for this job? I say it to the, person, the, the lady who delivers me my paycheck every month. I go, and they pay me. Um, you know, with the, the ability to go and talk to new teachers and people who want to be into the profession is great. Well, and, I mean, and, and, and for other people to say, you've, you've 
put teachers in the light we want them to be is there are, there are, humbling. There, 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 are time, there are times as a teacher when actually you feel a bit po-faced because you're like this moral guardian of the world yeah. and you're sitting there in judgment over people and you are sitting in judgment, not just over the kids, you're sitting in judgment over their families yeah. because you are. In actual fact, you'll sit with parents and kids sometimes and you'll sit there and after about a minute you're thinking, do you know what, teenager, you're not the problem. Mm. You're the problem. The problem is the adult. And actually, you're doing as much educating as the adult as you are the child. And I remember when I was a first teacher, of being about 24, 25, looking at these people in their 40s with their teenage children and basically trying to educate them on how to be parents when all I had was like a one-year-old child. So there are times when you feel a bit po-faced about it, but then when you meet people and talk to people who have watched the programme and say, I want to be a teacher because you do this, I want to be a teacher because you do that, I think education is great because you do that. Actually, it completely re it really reinvigorates the purpose that you have. So I think that for education, it's done a really good thing of maybe giving people an understanding of the real moral purpose and the effort that mm. teachers put in um, the education of young people. Are you... Um, we're going to move to some questions. Are you OK to take some questions? Yeah. Yeah. Have we got a roving mic? Hello. Who'd like to ask something? The editor of the Daily Mail would like to start. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, um, they're, they're oh, in hell uh, at the moment. Right, they can't. Uh, but this lady with the red T-shirt here, please. Um, Hello. Congratulations, great show, fantastic. Um, I just wanted to ask you about some of the reactions of the parents because obviously there were times at which you spoke quite candidly about their children. Uh, I just wondered if you had any um, any visits or no, no different. We speak as candidly to them absolutely. about their children already, so they didn't. They're used to hearing that. Yeah, the, the impact on the children and the parents of our kids was almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. because what they saw on telly was an edited version of what they see every day. You know, it, there's, no, there's nothing different they saw. OK, yeah, they don't see what goes on. They don't see designer beaver being given or anything else, but they see us as human beings because that's who we are. So there was zero impact, literally zero impact, because there was nothing new on what they saw. The only thing I would say is that afterwards, and it wasn't parents of kids who'd been in the show, it was parents of kids who weren't in the show, who were maybe the year below, so this year's year 11, who, we'd ha who were having really hard times with, month after month after month, yeah. and at least four or five of our most difficult parents who had spent a year shouting at both of us, telling us we were the cause of all of their child's problems, within a few weeks of the programme being ca coming on, I remember one parent coming up to me outside the building and going, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I've had, yeah, apologies. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Actually, all those times I said that you were just a bastard and it was all your fault, you're yeah. clearly not. I'm really sorry. The amount of single dads I've now had to have meetings with, because normally, you know, you phone the mum, mum comes in, you talk to mum, dad may be told, may not be told. The amount of dads who are no longer with mum who've said, Mr. God, I really care about my son, I'd like to come in and talk to you too. That's completely new. It's been a pain because I've had to do twice as many interviews because they can't sit in the same room like two grown-ups about their child. But what a fantastic legacy that is. Mm. That actually some parents who don't act, have never given a damn before now do, even if it's a veneer of giving a damn, they, they're at least part of it. So it's, it was positive, the, the interview with parents. Should we... Should we like, Rex, can this man here take a question? Thank you. Hi, I, I, I really love the series. I, I thought, but I, I really thought right, it was obviously it was about teaching, but actually it was about state education, state te state school teaching. I just it was about wondered, a box standard comp. Yeah, I mean, I just wondered whether uh, it's really a question for Mark whether you considered the second series being about a private school as a kind of companion piece rather than revisiting perhaps some of the same themes of, about state education, the challenges of state, specifically state education. Yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I think the there's there's so many stories still to tell that it would be too soon for me to go to a private school. Yeah, and also I feel that that this uh, series was our bog standard comp, as it were, as it just said. I think the, the next school will be in that vein, but have different elements to it. And so for me, I think there's a, there's you know when we started out, we were trying to look at teenage life through that school, and I think we're going to do that again. Uh, but in a slightly different in a slightly different way, and I think it will feel very different. So mm. I'm optimistic that by doing it again in another state school, it, you you still you make another creative leap forward. And then I don't know, we did we did look at a private school briefly, yeah. didn't we? It was a bit weird. It was a bit weird. <laughs> the reason I ask is because I've, I've heard on the great one that Sky One are doing Harrow, and they're ah. apparently they're doing I think they're doing a lot, like eight hours, six hours, eight hours, and they must be absolutely crapping themselves because you know, and it's not a rig. 
So it, it must be quite daunting for them, the prospect of doing such a major thing about another school, mm. a posh school, uh, with this in the background. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know how, I'm sure that'll be a, a roaring success, but I, I, I think that it's tricky to get the level of actuality you need to make a compelling piece of television doing single camera, mm. plot. I mean, the level of the faith that Vic had, and I remember when I went round, shook his hand, it was like he was in. And it was like, for, from a program maker's point of view, you, you know, it's brilliant, because you, you could then take him with you. And as you, as you guys know, often there's a little bit of friction there. So they're not completely in, they were in, in their own way. I imagine Harrow wouldn't be quite as uh, wholehearted as, as Vic. I, I can't imagine it any, how it would work with somebody with a camera. I just can't imagine how that would work because what the journey home every night was, oh, bollocks, there's cameras in my office. You know, what did I do today? Did I, did I scratch? Did I, you know, all those sorts of things that, because you forget, you know, and people found that really hard to be, I, in my office, which was a third of the size of this stage, there were four cameras and eight hanging microphones, but I forgot they were there because actually in that moment of emotion with that young person, it doesn't matter because it's wallpaper. We're going to have, have, have we got time for one more? One more little one. And then do we have time for the clip? Fantastic. Hello. Hi. Um, this is a question for the teachers. Obviously, it's been very successful and you've come out of this with your heads held high and rightfully so. But what I was wondering is, you've talked about trust and how eventually you had to trust mm -hmm. people. But it, still, it would have been easier to just say no. So how much of a challenge, how much of this was just a challenge to yourselves? I mean, I would, I would very briefly, I would refer to actually, it seems very bizarre to quote myself, but I would refer to one of the things that came out of the pod interviews, and it's something that stuck with me all the time, even though I said it. When David asked me something like, something about hard work, and I said something hard like, um, what's the problem with hard work? Yeah. Hard work's good, hard work makes you better. Yeah. And actually, for us as teachers, everything for young people, you encourage young people to take risks. Well, as Vic said at the start, if you as the adults in the lives of the young people don't take risks and don't take leaps of faith at times, then you're letting them down. They, young people learn from what the adults around them do. And if you're just so safe all the time and don't do anything, how do they ever learn to get better? So you know, for me, that's part of the challenge and that's part of what is actually attractive about it once they convince me. I think it's, I think it's a na the, na <laughs> the naivety. For me, I said yes in, in, with great naivety. I'll be honest, you know, I had no concept at all that it would be seen by as many people. I don't think because also the yeah, other thing to I think guess. about is the sense that it was very much at the beginning a series about teenagers and that's how it sort of evolved during the development stages really. But, that but the became... difference is David that you, you, if it was crap you walk away and make another series somewhere else. If it's crap and it's negative for my school I stay in that school. Yeah. You know, so you, you can be naive, but you're naive in a nice little, a nice little ivory tower that doesn't actually affect. I don't mean that horribly, but <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah, I did. Be, be, don't, don't be horrible to them. No. <laughs> um, for, they're lovely. But actually, for us, it was a naive decision taken with children's lives, yeah. and actually, in in hindsight, probably was taken too quickly. However. But I felt it so well, yeah, so I, it was great. I felt comfortable with that because I know him. And yeah. so when I met you, yeah. I've had faith in him and he's not going to turn you over. Even absolutely. though you know it's bigger now yeah. than you thought it was, yeah, I have faith and I, I could see that. So yeah. I think there was well, some judgment there. It all worked out beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And um, I'm going to show a clip that sums it all up beautifully about what actually did happen. But before I show it, um, I just want to say thank you to you all because it's been... I don't know what happened with these guys, but I had a brilliant time. <laughs> <laughs> I really have. Thank you. And thank you so much for doing it. Um, and we'll go to a clip which um, illustrates um, how you all did succeed in what you set off to do. <laughs> <laughs> 